when the disaster occurred, when the explosion of the rig occurred, um, I really was interested in going down and going going down to Louisiana and doing some filming of the environment. And uh, but the expense was a little too much uh, for me to just to go. Uh, so after about a month of um, listening to reports and seeing it all on the media, I got to talking to some individuals here at Eastern. And <clears throat> what happened was is that the, it inspired me to go beyond you know, my own personal uh, uh, finances and ask for additional um, uh, funds to take a group of three students down. And so basically uh, there were three students uh, from WEIU, uh, Center for Academic Technology Support, CATS, and the Geology Geography Department. And we all went down there and to go and experience this. What I told the kids was that we were not going down there with a preconceived notion of what we were going to see, although it is very difficult. Um, but at least we could go down there with, uh, without any storyline for the documentary or the project, but go down there and experience it. And so that was, that was, that was the priority for this project. I think coming from this standpoint, this was a different opportunity that a lot of students do not get to receive. We had the chance to go down to the Gulf Coast, which is unique for really any documentary group, any news organization, especially because of the distance coming from the Midwest and being able to go down to the Gulf Coast is a very unique experience. And then on top of that, to be coming from a university setting and to be able to actually go down there and get the hands-on experience of speaking with people who are directly affected and also indirectly affected by this disaster, and also having the opportunity to get the first-hand experience of what was going on down there, and not just seeing it from other media outlets, but being able to see it firsthand through our own eyes. I think we're extremely fortunate to get down here on a day like this. We could have gotten a car and driven 14 hours and it could have been raining or just a cloudy day and we had a perfect, beautiful sunny day and it couldn't have been any better. The guards were nice, let us down there and I think uh, you'll have to change your shorts after this is all said and done after all that, but it was a pretty awesome experience. I don't know, it's kind of sad to be honest. I mean, I never really thought of Grand Isle as a place where people lived. I just heard about it and the oil and I never put two and two together but driving out here I think that was really is a solemn feeling driving out here and seeing all the houses and the signs that people had up saying things about BP where it really shows that it's impacting people and I think that's something that I never really thought of I never thought people actually lived here I thought it was just a little island it hurt the environment but I never realized that it's such an impact on the people who are here First, after dealing with the law enforcement, uh, the first feeling uh, was what ha just happened. What, because when we, we crossed that, we see all of the booms. We see military personnel. Um, but what we didn't expect, what I didn't expect, was a completely clean beach. That was where's, where, where, what happened to the story. What happened to... You know, everything that we see on, on the media or saw on the media, that completely changed our attitude uh, as far as actually seeing it firsthand. And so they cleaned it up pretty quickly. Now, there was an, an individual that came, uh, that went down to the Grand Isle a week before we arrived, that we arrived. And they found that they took pictures and there was oil everywhere. And uh, when we went down there, it was all cleaned up, so it was very impressive. It was it was quite um, mind-boggling to think that you know it's never going to be perfect. We're going when you know setting foot on this beach. It's not. It's never going to be like it was.
you're on a you're on a barrier island in the Gulf of Mexico, whose name is Dolphin Island, spelled D-A-U-P-H-I-N. Uh, it it has a very rich history uh, from the French, Spanish, British. Uh, it was a hotbed during the uh, uh, Civil War. So there's a lot of historic value to our little island. But our little island is, is uh, originally was only 14 miles long, very narrow. And Hurricane Katrina cut off seven miles of the island, which luckily for us was undeveloped. So we have a little seven mile island. There's approximately uh, 1,100 registered voters. Uh, we are so small we don't even have a traffic light. And it's 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 a bedroom community and a semi resort, and the beach houses that people come down and rent are are homes that individuals own. They're not large corporations. There there are uh, two small, two, well not small. There are two developments of condominiums, and they're also rented. But there are days that even during the season one can walk on the beach and you may see one or two people. This is not like. Uh, Jones Beach in New Jersey, or uh, this is a very quiet, uh, good place to bring a book, Resort <coughs> Island. The sands on our beaches are, are sugar white. Uh, unlike uh, California or the Northeast, we have no stones, there's no coral, it's pure white sand. The only thing that ever really mars the sand would be seaweed or an occasional seagull <laughs> dropping by. <laughs> you know, most of the Gulf has handled this with grace, with the grace that the Gulf gives us. And, um, you know, we, we work. We don't mind working, that's what we do. And um, we don't want a handout, but we would like what's fair. And we wanna make sure, and we're gonna fight for what's fair and what's right. And, um, but I don't want to have to wait 30 years like they did with Exxon uh, Valdez with the settlements and everything. I mean, that, that's not right either. So, I would have to um, say one of the most yeah, powerful interviews I thought was coming from body. Amy, Amy Weiss, just because, and I don't know if it was because she talked about her family and how just her little daughter was affected by this oil spill, how she couldn't go swimming, how she was asking questions, how they were worried about their island being shut down and her preschool being shut down. I don't know if that was it, but she really brought it down to a personal level and showed it's not just affecting businesses, it's not just affecting the economy, it was affecting her home life, her personal life. She spent numerous hours, extra hours at work trying to deal with reservations and problems with clients because of this oil spill. So she was away from home and then she was still explaining this to her daughter about what was going on. And it really showed how just this spill affect every walk of life down there, whether we're talking about businesses, whether we're talking about just home life. It affected everyone. The situation with Dolphin Island right now is with this BP oil spill has had a major impact on our businesses, on the town. Just the perception of the oil, even if the oil isn't on the beach, is very damaging to the fishermen, to the oystermen. And uh, on this little island, that's what they all do. They're all involved in that line of work. So, and it ripples down, you know, to, to everybody. If they're not selling seafood, then, you know, they're not buying something else. But uh, we've had a lot of cancellations. And like I say, even if the oil isn't on the beach, the perception that's given like through the media and everything else, it might as well be there because it uh, has the same effect. It started the first weekend of May. Yep. And um, our our phone, we walked in that Monday morning, and oh, our 52 phone. 52 messages. Yeah, 52 messages waiting for That's us right. to pick yeah. up in the morning. Um, and our phone never stopped until probably a, a, a week ago, uh, this past Friday. Everything was canceled. And so. everything, basically, the majority of our reservations are canceled. So we're not receiving the cancellation calls anymore. The phone has stopped ringing. We should be receiving calls for reservations. All we've received is cancellation calls. And um, it's, it's just, it's a completely different um, change of not only lifestyle, but in the way of doing business on Dauphin Island. 
um, we're, we're having to change gear and rewrite everything that we do. It's like a silent killer is what it is, and we, evasion is a good way to describe it. We have more people on this island from BP than we have residents. First, when, when, when the rig exploded, um, and then several days later they found out that the wellhead was leaking, um, I, I think at that point in time it, it hit us that we're at the head of the Gulf, we're in the Gulf of Mexico, um, we're a barrier island but we are populated, and, and um, I, I think that that's when it really first started to hit us. And then of course the panic set in with the crews coming onto the island, setting up all of the command centers. Um, uh, just a mass influx of workers being here. And we were kind of in a state of confusion, chaos. Occupation. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we were, we, were, we were really frightened. And then of course the, 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 the phone call started with the cancellations because of the media coverage on it. And it, it's, it wasn't also necessarily negative coverage, but it's a negative perception. They moved in with large crews um, quite a few weeks ago, and the island hasn't been the same since because there's so many people on the island. Um, the media made it look like you know we were just slathered with oil for for months now, so tourism dropped in a hurry. Instead of the happy-go-lucky vacation island and tourist island, we're now the contractor island, and it's it's a total different feel for us and trying to raise a family here and trying to keep everything as normal as possible on the human side I mean on that side it's completely different you know it's like Gracie it's okay to come outside today we don't smell fuel or whatever and we haven't smelled fuel in probably a week and a half two weeks so and um, you know they just opened our swimming waters again so now we can go in the water um, and that's what we do. I mean, we swim, we fish, and we rent the island or sell the island. We want people to enjoy us. Our little Dolphin Island, the three months that these businesses operate, it's kind of like Christmas for a big store. You know, they what they make during the summer gets them through the winter. This thing's really slow down, so to lose all the rentals and the, you know, whatever business you're in, selling snow cones or or whatever, you know, you're, you're not making the money you thought you'd make. And a lot of our fishermen, you know, because they've been closed down, snapper season closed down, you know, even shrimping season closed down. So they're, you know, they're hired on with BP just to make some money, keep their head above water, you know, so. And just to hear the stories about how this island was affected by Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Ivan, the oil, and just to get that view where these people really feared that their home, this little island where they set up their lives, would become a toxic wasteland. That's something that you really don't hear about in the United States. I mean, coming from the Midwest, coming from Illinois, I've never looked at my home and worried, you know, what if one day I couldn't come back here? What if there was some disaster where it just became a toxic dump? That's not something that you really think about. Well, Katrina we had came from the Gulf, from the south, and Ivan the year before came from the north because we were on opposite sides of the storm. So for the first time in many, many years with Ivan, the, the whole island got flooded in areas that hadn't been, like the, the village areas, even this house had water up in it which hadn't had since it had been built in 1912. So when Katrina came, the water came from the south, but it breached the whole public beach area, took all the dunes down, and then came right back down the boulevard, and everybody got drowned again, <laughs> our homes that were on the boulevard. Those that are on pilings didn't have as much damage on the east end of the island, where we are right now. But the West End, we lost over 300 homes for, with Katrina. I think they're depressed because, like I say, with a hurricane, you feel a little more in control. This, you don't have any control. And you, you want to do something, but you don't know what to do. 
you know, I mean, and sometimes you wonder if they know what to do, to tell you the truth, but uh, from an average person, you know, they can't go out and clean the birds, they can't, you know, unless you're skimming or something, you, you feel helpless. So, it's not a good, not a good feeling. Since Ivan and Katrina, we haven't had as good a tourism until this year. It's been slowly building, but this was the best year we've had. And then it went <laughs> So, it's something we've got to adapt to. I would say in the long-term effect, it probably is worse than Katrina. Yes, as the long-range potential loss, it's probably going to be worse than Katrina. And that was bad. I think we've gone through several stages of um, frustration. First, it was disbelief uh, that it would continue to go. We felt that there would be uh, definitely an end in sight. Uh, we're not an island surrounded by oil. We're an island that, an island that has gas rigs. So we don't have typically the results of oil rigs here on this area. Um, it's become a complete frustration as of May 1st. In our business, we have 118 vacation rentals. We make 75% of our entire revenues in the three months that we're going through business right now. Uh, we have had 228 cancellations in those five weeks. And we are down to probably running in the range of 35 to 40% of our total annual revenues with just that short time. Uh, that's devastation. Then you have the impact of the BP claims process, which is a joke at best. Um, they are putting partial payments out, so there's a lot of people getting small checks. But businesses that need larger checks to pay for their payroll, their overhead, uh, is getting nowhere. They're getting 5000 against a $60,000 claim. They did ask me if I wanted to go and make a claim. I said, no, I need to work for our money. We don't need to go make a claim. The people we spoke with, they just want their normal lives back. They don't want any gain out of this. They don't want to make money or profit off of this. They just want everything back to normal. And I think this documentary will really show that. And it really shows just the human spirit and how people can come together in light of a natural disaster and help one another out and really brainstorm about how do we solve this problem and how do we get back to where we started from. The situation occurred immediately after we got back from the, the trip last summer. And I took the, the one hour interview on the porch, uh, a porch on Dauphin Island. Like, you know, and you know, I played bird, that hour you interview hit, for individuals way, for my senior you're seminar you're class. And it was the most exciting educational moment in the 10 years I've been teaching. After that interview was done, the students were just da -da -da -da, talking and chatting and discussing and debating all the issues that were presented in that one hour. And I didn't have to say anything. Their attitude and their perception and their ideas changed about this event. Of course, it was immediately after the event. Um, but the thing is, is that they were discussing and critically thinking about the event through the eyes of the, the people they were seeing. What if that does happen? I don't know. We don't know. BP says there's I don't, no buyout plan. Be here. This yeah. is, I, I moved to be here. I didn't, I mean, we chose this. And um, I don't want to leave this. And um, it's scary, but you can't think about it. And bear in mind, you, that you BP ad there. you guys are seeing on TV, the big BP ad, Tony Haber standing here saying, we are going to pay every legitimate claim. The pay every legitimate claim is the legal word that they have been using, whether it's a little guy sitting down here in our little claim center in Bayou La Battery in Louisiana. And according to the attorneys, that means we will pay as little as we can get by with. And that needs to be thought about. BP is huge. This is a terrible problem for them and their company. But what they are doing is, at this point, already starting to evade the actual process and slowing it down, doing partial payments instead of making companies whole Token during the month. Token at best.
Well, and they change the process every yeah. day, too. Yeah. I mean, one day the National Guard will walk in with a list of things that companies and property owners need to provide. The next day, ADEM walks in with a list of... Completely different list. A list of things that somebody needs to provide. One, well, the first time it was the BP claims adjusters that would come in with this. Second day was that, or second time was National Guard. Third time was ADEM. And uh, then we go or call, or a property owner goes and calls, and it's a totally new list. And then they put on these PR tents and air conditionings and weenie roast and all this other kind of crap. I don't care about a weenie roast. I would like to, anyway. Um, we it's don't, we will. totally different. Yeah. I mean, they'll smile big, but they perform nothing. They and they have me, done let me, nothing. Let me tell you about the BP that personnel rotation. That is the anger. Yeah. Then you oh, get yeah. into the let, anger of it. Amy, let me tell you about the yeah. BP personnel rotation. Every two weeks, well, they, they rotate to. them around. But the people who leave don't leave any records on what you or you have talked to. And the new person coming in says, bring me up to speed on this. Or I need and repeat what you did 10 days earlier. So it's a ploy. It's, it's a tactic. Stall. It's a stall. And they're asking for information that truly, this is a foreign oil company. They have no business with my personal tax records. They have no business with my social security number. That has absolutely nothing to do with my proof of loss for the month. That is all the heck they need. But oh no, we have a homeowner right now. That one of the phones that was ringing here beside me, that was a homeowner that had put her house on a rental program. They are demanding that she gives her social security number. She's saying, no, I've been told it's optional. The head of the BP claims here, a guy named Paul, said, no, you must give us your social security number or the claim process will not go forward. Why does BP have any right to our personal business, including social security numbers? That's why it's got to get the government between them and us. The film is put together so that there's very little narration. We want the viewer to make up their own mind, to hear the stories of these individuals that were impacted by the, 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 the situation, by the disaster. Um, and I want people to, to understand what it is to live in harm's way. These people, most, a great deal of number of these people, have already experienced Katrina. And they just got done dealing with Katrina. And then this thing happens. And so it, you, you, you become you empathize with them. You become more aware of their world. And I think that's very important. This, this film will, will provide a different worldview for the viewer. Um, and, and without us actually telling the story, but letting the interviewees um, tell their story. I think for me personally, it shows that you always need to look at the bigger picture. No matter what is going on, whether we're talking about natural disasters, war, famine, anything like that, you need to look at the bigger picture. Because a lot of times, what we see on TV and the stories that we hear, it's usually the worst case scenarios. It's the worst of the worst because that's what a lot of people want to hear. That really sends the message home of what's going on. But there's a much broader view. And I think this really helped me to realize that you need to look at the big picture and you need to see what exactly is going on. You need to look at all the different elements, all the different aspects of the situation. And until you do that, you really don't get a true feel for what's going on. I'm talking about just simply being allowed to continue to make a living. We're not talking about, well, let's get rich on this thing. You know, BP's got all the money. We're talking about trying to survive and earn what we were already in the process of earning just to keep our payroll in place, to keep things in place. Even though the oil may come to the shores, we'll still go down and watch the sun go down and watch it rise, you know, when we can. So it's, it's just home. You go across, you go to the fishermen, the, the shrimpers in Louisiana that I got the pleasure to meet a couple weeks back, those, those folks are doing what we're doing. They're working six days a week. But they do it because they love it. And they do it because of their, their sons and their generations are, are moving on. It's something they've developed as a lifestyle. It's not, it's not, oh, today I'm gonna sell cars, tomorrow I think I'll sell real estate. It's not that. It's what the price that you pay to live in paradise. 
and hopefully we'll be back to paradise.